I want to talk to you first about the genesis of this presentation. I gave a presentation about 18 months ago, and I used in it many examples from my personal working life. From the, I've worked for a number of companies. I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry, consumer products, beverage, financial services, and now in a global real estate and financial uh, and facilities management uh, business. So I used a lot of examples that I thought were really profound. And I used one example that I actually heard, a story that I heard on a cruise ship about uh, Captain uh, John Cook and how he discovered Easter Island. And I won't, I won't take you through all of that, but when it was all done, I got a lot of emails from people saying that they really enjoyed the presentation. Every single follow-up that I got mentioned the John Cook example, and not one person said anything about the example from my working career, the many, the hundred examples from my working career. So I started thinking then that maybe my own examples aren't as profound as uh, I thought they were. So I took some notes I had been making for uh, meetings that I've had with some of the junior folks at our company, some little tips for them as they, as they go into their, uh, uh, their roles in our firm. And over the course of the last 18 months, whenever I read an article or saw something um, that I thought would be a relevant example, I kind of threw it in. So what I'm going to do is walk you through some negotiating tips that I have given to other people and show you some examples uh, in history um, on, uh, on other people who have used them successfully. Um, I'll also tell you that there are a couple of examples from my, my career in there because I just couldn't resist. Okay, negotiating tip number one, do your research. Okay, that to me, if there's, if there's anything that you take away from here, it is to spend that time doing your research. And I'll give you an example of how that worked really well for me personally. Uh, I was uh, at Diageo, which is the world's largest liquor company, and in the United States, the second largest uh, buyer of glass. But there aren't too many glass companies, and there aren't too many glass plants, and number one, which is Anheuser-Busch, is a whole lot bigger. So even though we were number two, we were outpaced by number one a lot. And um, we couldn't get what we needed from the glass companies. We were, we were two, and as I said, we were, we were number two with a big gap. So someone came up with the idea of mapping out all of the participants and all of the things going on in the business. And we sat in a room for a couple of days, and we had people's names, and we had org charts, and we called up people that we knew, and we did whatever research we could. And we came to the conclusion that there were a couple of people on the glass manufacturer side who, because of situations they were in personally, really had a lot to lose if this deal didn't go through. And with that knowledge, we were able to target those individuals, and we worked really hard to get them to see our side and to get them to see what we needed to, um, uh, to accomplish. And in fact, it worked. We got, we got where we needed to go. But it was only some kind of aha moments that we had when we sat and we really focused and said of the plethora of folks we've talked to, who in here is, uh, is someone that, that is going to help us. So the support I found from history was none other than Attila the Hun. Okay, Attila the Hun, scourge of Europe uh, in, in the year 450, probably the worst teenager ever. Um, and Attila, as he uh, plundered through Europe as he tried to take over the Eastern Empire and the, uh, the Roman Empire, said, never trust negotiations to luck. Enter every session armed with knowledge of the enemy's strengths and weaknesses, knowing his secrets made you strong, and makes you strong. And when I read that, I immediately thought of that glass company situation. It was right. Understanding where these people might be coming from and where they might be vulnerable made a huge difference in the results we were able to get. So I leave you that as negotiation tip number one. My other thought here is look beyond the obvious, right? When we did this, it was about 10 years ago. And so we didn't have Google and LinkedIn and all these other places to look now. Um, you, uh, we all do Google searches. We all do LinkedIn searches. But more and more, I'm finding that in my own LinkedIn profile, people are, are recommending me. They're, they're, um, 
um, you know, commenting on competencies, and in some cases, they're people that I've never even worked with. So, you know, think about the other sources. Think about picking up the phone also to try to sort of understand the situation behind uh, a company or an individual that you might be going to negotiate with. Okay, negotiation tip number two, follow the steps. Okay, go through the process, whatever the process is. You know, there are five step, seven step, you know, eight step processes. They're all very similar in that they are just methodical. Just like doing your research, they are, um, you know, do certain things, make sure you cover your bases in terms of, of thoroughness. And for my example here, the 2011 NFL walkout, lockout, when for four and a half months, football in the United States came to a grinding halt. The owners and the players disagreed on just about everything. Um, and yet, four and a half years later, or four and a half months later, they came to a conclusion. And they disagreed on player salaries, benefits, the length of the season, um, uh, you know, how rookie, the rookie system, you name it, um, it was a source of disagreement. Generally speaking, as I did this research, Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, was credited with using his negotiation skills to help end that lockout. Now, I have to give you a caveat. I live and I, I devote my time between Connecticut and New York, so of course we're going to be a little biased. Certainly that's what we found in the Boston and the New York uh, and the Connecticut papers, but I found them in the Huffington Post and some other websites as well. Okay? There are four key negotiation tactics that he used that I'll share with you here. Number one, establish relationships of trust. He had the advantage of having a private plane and he gave some of the key negotiators for the players rides to some of the negotiation sessions and used that time, the banter, the chit chat and things like that to establish some basic relationships. Number two, generate options. Something that he encouraged the owners and the players to do is divide into small groups one on one and tackle some of the issues. Rather than sitting with, uh, constantly in big meeting rooms with lawyers on each side, sit down together, work, work it out, and come back to the bigger group um, with some ideas. Convince your side to make concessions at some key points, all right? So, you know, they, they settled a bunch of little points. There were um, some big points there uh, uh, to still be dealt with. And he came up with the idea, he went back to the owners and got their agreement to concede on some of the issues involving the rookie process. Well, that opened things up for then the players to do some, some um, uh, concessions of their own and, and, and help that, that process. And you know, you read a lot about don't make the first move, it's important. You have a disadvantage when you do that. I actually don't believe that. Because I've been, and I'll bet lots of you have been in those situations where you're just in a stalemate. Sometimes making that first move kind of puts pressure on the other person to make a move as well. You've already conceded on something, right? And you think about it. I think there's power in, in making that first move. And then he, he negotiated for the, for the long term and had a, a long term view as he um, tried to make these things happen. Okay. Negotiation tip number three comes from none other than the Texas Rangers, the original Texas Rangers, and my boss, my former boss, John Adams from Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, the Texas Rangers have been in existence for almost 200 years, and even today they're considered some of the most highly trained you know, law enforcement people, certainly in the United States. I was in a situation where the company I was working for was acquiring, actually was merging with another large firm. Lots of tension on both sides, as you can imagine, right? Who's going to end up with the jobs? Who's going to end up on top? You know, what's going to happen with the supply chain organization? Uh, and I flew to Scotland for a meeting, a global meeting that was taking place there. And somehow we got miscued 
And I walked into this meeting room and I, by myself, and there were six people from the other company sitting there, all, all levels, several people of whom really outranked me. And I panicked. And I called John up and I said, John, what do I do? What am I going to do? Like I walked into this thing and there's all these guys and this one's a vice president and, 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 and I'm only a director and you know, they're all looking up to him and how am I going to manage this? And John said to me, one riot, one ranger, and he hung up the phone. All right? And um, it says Captain Bill McDonald said that in 1896. Well, John Adams said that in 2005. Okay? And it, it um, as when I came back after the meeting, I came back to the United States, I thought about that a lot. And, you know, John knew what he was doing when he sent me there alone, right? It put me in a situation of being able to gather data. I gathered information, but by myself, I couldn't really make any decisions. I wasn't going to get in, into a tussle. I just observed. And I came back with all that information that John, as he explained to me afterwards, believed would put us in a better negotiating position as we put things through um, and, and sorted things out. So sometimes you do it alone. And I think that we all, human nature, right, tend to operate in packs. You know, I know particularly when I'm going to a new country, um, you know, or to some place I haven't been before, it's very comfortable to go with somebody on my team. And I step back now and say, is that really the best thing to do? Do I send the, re the best message by showing up in a group, or am I better off just showing up myself for this situation? Okay? Because sometimes, if you're dealing with someone in your own firm who's very cost conscious, they might be objecting to the fact that you just brought three people to this meeting. So, you know, a, a, a little nugget that I've uh, tried to carry with me. Sometimes you do it alone, but sometimes you need help. And I have a couple of examples of situations where companies needed help uh, and got that help in order to accomplish what they wanted. One of these comes from Procter & Gamble. I was actually at a meeting last week, and I got an opportunity to listen to the head of new business development uh, at Procter & Gamble talk about um, Tide Pods, um, which had been a, a huge runaway success for the firm. Now, those of you who... who have never seen them or used them. Basically, it's for washing your clothes. There are three different components in the pod. And they're components that react badly um, and react very quickly with each other. And if they put them together in a box, it would all just dissipate and be worthless by the time it got to you. There'd be some, some kind of chemical reactions. So they needed a film. They needed a product that would separate the components until it dissolved in water and they all came together and formed a chemical reaction. P&G didn't have that capability. They didn't have the chemistry to be able to make that film, but a little company in the Midwest did. And the P&G director said, you know, we were, we came in, we were Procter & Gamble, we were working with these guys, and um, you know, when it came down to doing the contract, we shortly hit a stalemate. And we, we hit a stalemate because we're P&G. We want it all. We'll pay you a royalty or whatever, and that'll be done with it. And the little manufacturer had some different ideas. And he said to us, you know, when we really understood what we needed by way of intellectual property, when we clearly sat down, the P&G team, and understood what we were looking for, the reality was we cared a lot about having that, the use of this idea in cleaning. We don't care about the use of this in pharmaceuticals, right? If there's a drug delivery system that might use something like this at some point in time. And they were able, once they were able to kind of overcome that hurdle themselves, they were able to partner up with this company and make this product happen, keeping for themselves or, get, or obtaining for themselves to write the right to use it the way they wanted and allowing the, uh, or agreeing that the manufacturer and creator could use it in the way that they saw fit. Another example of working with others to get things done is Starbucks, right? Starbucks, lots of little coffee shops around the globe, partnered with Pepsi and their great distribution system in all kinds of places, um, uh, 
you know, uh, gas stations and convenience stores and things like that. To get the Frappuccino product made, because Starbucks didn't have manufacturing of their own, but also to get it distributed. They partnered with Kraft and their presence in the grocery store market to get their coffee distributed on a mass basis and on the shelves of your grocery store. Partnered with Barnes and Nobles to create the Barnes and Noble Cafe. Okay, Barnes and Noble had lots of people coming and staying to read their books. Why not have a cappuccino along with that? And with United Airlines for, um, for continual advertising. If you're, if you're taking a, a United Airlines flight, you'll see the Starbucks logo on their coffee cups. So lots of examples of how they use lots of people. So sometimes you need to do it yourself. Sometimes you need a partner, and sometimes you need a lot of partners. Negotiating tip number four, keep working on that contract until you're happy with it, and make sure you read that contract. Here's my supporting example. Thomas Jefferson, okay, a couple hundred years ago, the early 1800s, negotiated with Napoleon for the Louisiana Purchase, okay? But Jefferson didn't read the contract all the way through, right? He thought he was getting a certain piece of, of land, but he didn't get Western Florida. He only got a tiny bit of land around the delta of the Mississippi River. And there was lots of space on each side populated by Americans who expected to be um, part of the United States, had settled there in anticipation of the deal going through, and were suddenly left in a no-man's land. He had to send emissaries over to France. Lots of negotiations for years and years. A few local revolts by the folks living there saying, what happened? And a U.S. occupation of the space for a while. And in the end, it took 16 years to resolve. Now, that, of course, is an extreme example, but you think of how many times you go back to a contract because you, you need to get out of it or you need to change something, and you realize that it wasn't negotiated with the future in mind, or you missed a point. You, know, you knew that maybe the company would be changing systems, but you didn't think about that when you allowed for uh, fees to be paid if you have to terminate for convenience. Okay. Now, for the next example. Some people are mean, and some people are not. If you are this, don't try to be that. Capitalize on your strengths. Deb Stanton yesterday, for those people who were in the women's lunch or the women's breakfast, when we were going around the table saying what advice would we give and when we were throwing ideas up there, Deb said, be nice. I learned that from a guy named Brian McGrath who at the time I was with Johnson & Johnson was considered to be the absolute best negotiator that J&J &J had. And Brian, I was, he was my mentor, and he's the person who took me from an engineering role into um, a procurement. And Brian told me, when you're in this situation and you have to decide whether to be mean or be nice, be nice. People would say to him all the time, oh my God, you must be a tiger. Look at what you just negotiated for us. Um, they'd say, you must, be, you must be horrible to work with. You must be a scary guy when you sit across the table. And I sat at his side as he negotiated many deals. And you know what? He was none of them because he followed the other four tips. He was the consummate preparer. He did his research. He had a plan all laid out that he followed. He was confident when he went into negotiations, and he could be nice. In fact, I'll tell you his deep, dark secret only because um, he's retired now. He had a dog bone, uh, a plastic dog bone that somebody gave him that barked. And sometimes when things were really tense, 
and, and we were really at a stalemate. And at the time, we were negotiating a lot of agreements for outsourcing or insourcing or, or you know, really changing the footprint of our manufacturing. Brian would stand up and kind of, kind of do a little something with his back, and he'd hit the dog bone, which would be you know, somewhere in his office, and it would bark. And everybody would go, oh my god, what was that? Um, uh, and it would diffuse everything. All of a sudden, everybody would be looking for the dog. Now, that's a silly example, maybe, but, but the tenant of Brian being a good person who had a good sense of humor and um, was often really in a position of power. When you work for Johnson & Johnson, everybody wants to work with you. Um, you know, and he could have been demanding, mean, nasty, all kinds of things, and we still would have gotten concessions and people still could have done things, but he had his view on the long run. My next example comes from American history as well. This is Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant, who at the end of the U.S. Civil War, as the Confederate Army was um, uh, struggling, barely together, started sending letters back and forth to negotiate the terms of the end of the war. And, um, Coming out of the Civil War, I read in multiple sources that Lee would not let a bad word be said about, about Grant. That in fact, although they were enemies for years, as they did the negotiation and came to the end of the war, the agreement was that the soldiers had to give back any of the arms that were issued to them, the guns and the ammunition, and agree not to take up arms against the U.S. government. And the soldiers could take with them any personal sidearms, any personal baggage. They got rations to get themselves back home. And they got to take the horses and mules so that they could carry out the spring planting. In the letters that he left, Robert E. Lee, after his death, Robert E. Lee said, you know, he had feared imprisonment. He had feared soldiers getting hung for treason, and that was never on the table. Grant won, um, but he did it in a way that was gracious and allowed the South to help recover. And, you know, I get a lot of pressure, and I'll bet you get pressure too, from people who just want to squeeze that last little bit out of a supplier. And I'm a huge believer in making sure in the end that a supplier has the, the structure in place and the right kind of deal in place with my company that they're going to be able to, to do well and succeed under our agreement. I had a conversation with someone recently who was a software provider to us. And she talked about another firm that she had just done an agreement, a firm much larger than ours that her company wanted very badly. She said, you know, at the end of the deal, um, the CPO stopped and said, you know what, we've gone far enough with these negotiations. This is fair. Um, you know, we'll, we'll stop here. If there's anything left, you guys keep it to cover contingencies or things that, you, that are going to come up during the cost of the implementation. And she said she was so grateful for that because she said, I would have gone lower but it would have put us in an uncomfortably low situation. And this was a better thing. I left that negotiation in a win-win situation um, as, uh, as Robert E. Lee felt uh, when that deal was negotiated. Another person with some thoughts along those lines, J. Paul Getty. In the, he founded Getty Oil and in the 1950s was the richest man in the United States. Okay. What did he say? You must never try to make all the money that's in a deal. Let the other fellow make some money too, because if you have the reputation for always making all the money, you won't have many deals. Right? I think that's important for us to think about, right? We get, again, you know, um, uh, pressure for cost savings. You have to think about making sure that we leave a supplier in a good, uh, a good position. 
My next example comes from the lowly purchasing card. Now, if you work for a giant corporation, a, you know, a company that, that's really quite large, this may not fit for you, but for me in a mid-sized firm, it fits quite well. Purchasing card, we're really happy with the purchasing card here in the United States. Working well, helping us out, lots of suppliers use it, saving a lot of, of effort and a lot of paper uh, in the AP group. But when we tried to implement it outside the United States, we, didn't, we couldn't get anywhere. We didn't have enough volume in the other countries, and most importantly, there weren't enough suppliers willing to take it in the countries where we did have volume. We looked at it and we just kind of put it aside. Then came the London Olympics. And for us, outside of the US, London is our second largest um, uh, unit. Okay, The UK is our second largest unit. London Olympics came and suddenly, right, they had to set up purchasing organizations and AP organizations. And so the London Olympics committee decided that if you were a vendor, and you were supplying something under X number of dollars, you had to take the P card. And so if you were in London or looking at, at P card acceptability in the UK before and after the Olympics, it's a very different animal now. The world has changed there. And, and um, where you didn't have many suppliers accepting it before, you have a lot of suppliers accepting it now. And also in the countries really close to the UK, France, for example, it's been a huge, huge uptick. So my tip from that is that a good idea is a good idea forever. Sometimes you just have to wait for conditions to change, right? The P-card idea is a great idea. You have to wait for parts of the world to catch up. And I would suggest to you that anybody who has a significant operation in Brazil should be watching this because I know, because I have a friend who worked on the Olympics team, that they're having conversations. The Brazilian Olympics team and the uh, UK Olympics team are talking about what they did well and what they didn't, and P-cards are one of the things that they think they did real well. So um, another thought. Changing somebody's mind. This is important when you're negotiating, right? Getting someone to change isn't easy. I read that um, particularly as you age and you have more experiences, there are neural ruts that get formed in your brain because you've seen something done the same way all the time and your brain starts to say this is the way it needs to be, right? And you can read some books and the books will tell you, well, you can try logic. You can try supporting data and documentation to get someone to change their mind. You can try to build on an existing relationship. I call that begging. Please, come on, we're friends. Okay. Or you can cite examples of how it's worked for other people. But it's hard to get someone, once they've got, once they've got something and they've verbalized it to other people, to make that change. Somewhere along the line, in one of the negotiating classes I took, okay, um, I heard a lot about that. People are reluctant to change their minds. If you want a different result, you need to change the conversation. I use this every day. I tell my team when they get told no by somebody, the conversation needs to change. One of my last uh, positions, I was told no by the head of facilities management who didn't want to work with procurement. She didn't see a reason why to work with procurement. And so I went away. And I worked with some other folks, and our organization engaged some other people who were a lot more open to working with the procurement team. When I went back to her, it was no longer, hey, come on, let's work together. You know, we can help you out. We can partner. It was, well, OK, we've done this, this, and this. Facilities is next. It's a very different conversation. Okay, and there was a whole lot more data, very different data, than what she had the first time. So my last example for you comes from Enron. Okay, a couple of years ago, the largest bankruptcy in the United States and considered to be the largest audit failure in the history of the United States. So as uh, things were sorting out, a key person in the 
prosecution's eyes was Andrew Fastow, the CFO. Okay. Andrew, they were counting on Andrew in exchange for a reduced sentence for himself to help implicate Kenneth Lay, the CEO of the company. Andrew didn't want to play ball. He knew he was going to jail. Uh, anyway, um, no matter what, he wasn't going to implicate. As they did their investigation, they discovered something. Okay? The investigators discovered that Andrew's wife, Leah, had accepted large gifts and uh, jewelry, a car, all kinds of things from Kenneth Lay and from people in the firm, and she had never declared um, uh, gift tax. She'd never paid any income tax on it. So suddenly, Leah was sitting there with a tax fraud um, um, situation and a situation where she was going to go to jail. So they went back to Andrew and said, now it's a different conversation. It's no longer about Kenneth Lay uh, and you implicating your boss. It's about you keeping your wife out of jail. And, and we all know what happened there. So that's it in terms of my examples. I hope you each got a nugget or something that uh, you'll take back with you. Uh, anyway, um, does anybody have any examples or anything of their own they'd like to share? We've got time for one question, if anyone has a question or a comment. I, uh, I thank you. Your examples were quite memorable. Uh, you know, one question I have it, oftentimes I would get involved in negotiations at the very last minute where the stakeholder is communicated to the vendor in essence that they are going to be selected. Uh, <clears throat> and there is a time crunch being put on procurement that you need to get this done by this date. So how could you recommend any strategies to negotiate from sort of that point of weakness? Hmm. Well, you know, number one, I'd still do my best to be as prepared as possible. Number two, I think you have to judge whether how true that is. There's a difference between, you know, if it's a chemical for a drug product, you're kind of out of luck. Um, if it's a flavor that's going into a, uh, a food product, well, you may have to step back and let that, let that supplier go forward and then reverse engineer going, going forward lay, uh, uh, further on. You can also, if you can't get a price concession, look for some ancillary services or something else for that vendor to do. You know, so uh, I, I would consider that. You know, a lot depends just on how real that deadline is. I get that a lot. And I'm going to guess maybe 40% of the time it's a real deadline, and the other 60% there's a lot more movement. So that's my thought there. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Joanna.